morning, everyone, and thank you for staying. So I'll be sharing with you our city conversing Palawan, Philippines, uh, the status, threats, and opportunities. Uh, Dr. Minas already provided an in-depth introduction of CP members, but just to mention it again, they are echinoderms, normally with elongated body and a pentaradial body symmetry, like the sea urchins and sea stars. They are distributed across the depths of the ocean, but commonly, they are found in seagrass beds, coral reefs, and mangroves. Uh, as mentioned, they aid in bioturbation and the recycling of sediments or nutrients in the ocean. Uh, Philippines has around 100 species and at least 50 of these are exploited for commercial purposes, particularly for production of charcoal. In the Philippines, it is our number 10 um, fishery product export commodity and Palawan shares around 20% of the country's production. So here in this photos are examples, some of the examples of sea cucumbers we have. Um, as mentioned, uh, they are primarily harvested for charpang or mare. It's an Asian luxury food. And also, recently, uh, for pharmaceutical and various nutraceutical products. And also for traditional use. So this is an example of a charpang uh, made into a very yummy <laughs> uh, food and of course the pharmaceutical and nutraceutical products all available online. So when you search city members, there will be a lot that will be popping out. Uh, this is Palawan, our province and uh, sea cucumbers are among the major uh, livelihood sources of our marginal fishers. There are about 44 species in our province and 36 of these are processed into trepang. So here in these photos you can see that early in the morning uh, the people will deliver their catch to the processor who will do the grading and sorting. It's uh, very interesting how they would price it by just um, feeling, you know, using the touch. They would say 20 pesos, 30. 50. Just by that, because they have to do that quickly since the uh, majority of the species that they collect, specifically the um, Sticopus species, are very sensitive and they could melt when exposed for a long time. Uh, in 2012, with the aid of Dr. Minas, we conducted an assessment in the province covering 16 sites and we have identified only 36, the others are not yet identified. Uh, this one here is vulnerable, the Econitis, and all of these are processed into Trapon. Yes, still a lot. Uh, this one, okay, we have not yet identified until this time. <laughs> so maybe the molecular aspect would help us, you know. This one, it's already identified as Gracilis. Back in 2012, we have not, uh, it's only SP1, but now it's only Surya Gracilis. Okay, and this, uh, more of the Stichopus and Telenota species. So we have here the Hermani, vulnerable, in danger, the Telenota ananas, but all these again are openly harvested. Um, all the photos I presented are processed into Turpan except for this uh, two and this one, the uh, Sinatta Makolata. So generally, uh, in the country, the sea cucumber fishery is small scale. Okay? Locally, we do not consume this much. Uh, some of the fishers would just do the prepare it in a pickled form and that's why we do not feel that uh, this resource is already declining because we do not consume it, we do not sell it in the market very seldom. So normally it will be directly processed and uh, for export purposes. Okay, so as um, gleaning is the most common form of gathering sea cucumbers, and this involves um, women and children. They do this during low tide. Uh, 
in the afternoon. <coughs> they barely do this low time in the morning because it will be very hot. Okay, so they do this in the afternoon. And another form is diving, and this involve, uh, involves men. Okay, they do this in shallow coral reefs where they can do skin diving because in the province it is now prohibited to use uh, hookah uh, or improvised uh, using improvised diving uh, gears. Okay, uh, but for diving we can further separate it into two as bycatch of those who are into spear fishing, and this is normally done during daytime. But there's another one, and this is quite alarming, the as target species at night. Um, we interviewed the fishers, and I was actually there. There is uh, every month, okay, normally it's during full moon and new moon when you have the spring tides, they would exchange fishing into gathering of city boomers because they have this, what we call, mass surfacing of Stikopa species that were in uh, at night time, at around 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock in the evening. Uh, they observed that a lot of sea cucumbers would come out of the coral reef. And so it is easier for them to gather them. And this form of fishing is more profitable than going out to do regular fishing activities. So we look at the income, um, the orange one, uh, their total income, and the light ones, the bars, are their income from city boomers. So we can see that um, divers in Johnson Island okay, uh, get around uh, 3,000 pesos per month from gathering city boomers. Uh, all actually the respondents there in our interview were, are had it come below poverty threshold, at present we have around 8,500, but as you can see, uh, they barely reach that threshold, so they are the poorest among the poor. But still, we can see here that city members uh, contribute, especially for women here in Johnson Island. You can see that almost 80% of their income, they get it from city member gathering. Now we have issues here because, as you can see, where the fishery is open access, despite of the loss that we have pertaining to its collection. Another is uh, the quality of dried products. Some of these are poor and, of course, they are low in value. Yes, and laws are not enforced. We have the, uh, the BIFAR actually issued as early as 2013, the Administrative Circular 248 that sets uh, five centimeters limit for, this, for the dried products. But later we can see that there are a lot of dried products below the minimum size. So for the status of fisheries, worldwide it has been reported already that it's declining based on um, the production. Okay, but in Palawan, we can see here um, in this graph Okay, the data in blue bars were from the PSA, and we got the red bars or data from BFAR, Provincial Fishery Office. So we can see here that the province production okay, is very low, okay, and, um, but it has a high production back in 2006. Okay, uh, Chu reported that the production is boom and bust, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Munez and has shifted from low volume, high value, to high volume, low value. So they tend to gather more to compensate okay, the value. And uh, it was also reported that in 2008, the Philippines is the only city cucumber hotspot in, in Southeast Asia. And we also have records that explain that species are increasing in number. Shock and Akimini did their study in Puerto Princesa City, Palawan, and I believe we have interviewed the same traders there. So we can see that from around 25 species, and some of these are were not yet identified. Uh, it has gone to 36. Okay, um, sorry. Here in this graph, you can see uh, I only selected the top three 
sea cucumber species and uh, look at their price over the years. So back in 2000 and 2005, for example, this Fusco Bilba was just around 20 to barely $40, but now it got to $120. And of course, this is higher because the exchange rate right now is higher compared uh, back in 2000. Okay, and the same for Stabra and also Stichopus horans. When they look at the global price, here is the study of parcel. You can see that um, the Scabra, okay, around $1,500 per kilogram. So we are talking about here the, the premium grade, the large and extra large, okay. And the Fuscobilba has a lower <coughs> price, but in our survey, okay, uh, their price is comparable. Uh, imagine from the Philippines, we only sell it at around the 5,000, 6,000 pesos per kilo. But in international market, the price has gone that high. <coughs> now we look also the, we look at the populations as well. And uh, studies have shown that, of course, as expected, areas open to exploitations have lower um, density estimates. The first one here, we did this back in 2012, and we can see that most of the municipalities have populations like below 50 individuals per hectare. So the studies said that if it's 100 individuals per hectare, that's already low. And 30 individuals and below, it's already critical, meaning it will be hard for the sea cucumbers to revive their population given that they are external spawners, so they need to get close to one another for the fertilization to be successful. And uh, here, we can see that the green bars are um, representing the seagrass beds, and this one is the unexploited site. So we can see that it got the highest uh, population estimates as compared to the coral reef and reef flats. And, um, but when you look at compare the unexploited to two exploited sites, they get very low, in fact, below 30. So looking at the individual, the population of individual species, again, the estimates are way higher in unexploited site, the green bars, as compared to those in exploited sites. So I've mentioned this as one of the issues, low quality undervalued, although the length of my pink is <laughs> relative, but it's comparable, you can see there. It's uh, horns probably, or Stichopus, just to be safe. Okay, it's extra small, its value only at 1,200 per kilo, but the extra, lar extra large of this uh, is but at 4,000 per kilo. This is another one, the Holothuria scabra. You can see this is 2 inches or 5 cm. So it's below. And there are two socks of this. Okay. Uh, possibly it's still a sub-adult stage when they gather <coughs> this. Okay. And uh, all of this we measured, it's already more than 100. But this one is rejected extra small RXS and that is only about that 1,000 per kilo whereas if they waited for it to grow, grow bigger okay, they could sell that up to 5,500 per kilo so major threat to the population unregulated massive harvesting and this uh, was actually triggered as reported by Purcell and as also observed in the field, okay? Um, the increasing market price, human populations, increasing poverty, especially in coastal population, in coastal communities. And another there is the accessibility and the ease of collection. Okay. However, don't be silent. <laughs> We have opportunities for this, but we need good governance and management. Okay, there is a technology available for the full cycle production of some valuable species for 
in the sense that Lutheria's covered, I believe uh, Dr. Minas and her group are working on the Horans. Okay? So the challenge now is to how to grow them okay, using economically viable techniques because you cannot just grow them in the hatchery, it will be very costly. Okay? Yeah, this one. So how to grow them from the juveniles to this premium grade, more than 300 uh, grams. So later I will show more of this. That's why in the aid of Dr. Minyes and her group uh, together with the Protect Wildlife, Earlier, um, Dr. Minyas presented their sea ranching activities in Bolinao and other parts of the country. So they have the technology for the ocean nurseries and we pilot tested it in Palawan. So we rarely had to reproduce sandfish in ocean nurseries for sea ranching sana. So here you can see the floating hapas that we used for um, rearing the hatchery produced juveniles around three to four millimeters. And by the way, as presented, they are the populations of scabra are genetically different. So we took the brood stocks also from the nearby sites and had it uh, spawned in Palawan Aquaculture Center. So it was delivered to us already in a juvenile form and uh, we stuck it. Yeah, 1,000 individuals and also 500 per hapa with replicates. Okay, so we did this activity together with the LGU, the local government of NARA in Palawan. Here they are, the staff of the Municipal Agriculture Office. Ms. Dr. Minyas, who is very handsome in teaching us how to do it, and Ms. Rana and Ryan. Yes. And uh, the results are actually promising. We have a very high survival, particularly in the second cycle. Well, it's quite expected because the um, individuals uh, grow a little bigger. And we also monitor the length. Okay, but what I want to highlight here, for the first cycle, by the way, uh, that lasted for 30 days. But for the second cycle, our monitoring was done after 15 days. So we did uh, two monitoring schedules for that's one month, 15 days, and then after 30 days. So you can see here that in terms of length during the second cycle, um, after 15 days, this one, they have a tremendous increase in size, almost double. But a look after rearing them for another 15 days, the mean length was reduced. Okay, the same here. Um, for the for the medium size, okay, you can see that there was no change. Okay, even if you rear them for another 15 days, okay, simply because they have already reached the threshold. So this is an experimental stage, and we wanted to see how we can culture them in the best way. So we look at the average growth rate. And uh, from here, we can see that it was during the second cycle, only after 15 days, that we get a net uh, growth rate. For the rearing them, we result to negative growth. Because you know, CP converts, if you stack them in higher density of, or if they are <coughs> stressed to their environment, they could shrink. That is their adaptive mechanism to reduce the metabolism requirement. Okay, so it doesn't make sense if you culture them in a, or put them in a pen and stack them and put a lot of individuals because they will just shrink, okay? So we recommend here that, by the way, we only rear them up to uh, 45 days. Actually, within 30 days, you can do selective harvesting already because there are shooters. So that's good because it will shorten up the rearing in HAPA nets because HAPA nets require some maintenance. You have to change the nets and uh, the weather should be good. And after that, at around two months old, we transferred them to advanced nurseries. We have here the pens. Okay. And they're at this stage around four months old. So after two months of uh, being in a pen, they were now at around uh, 200 grams. Okay, so I was involved during the first um, stage, but I've heard that uh, after this, uh, they were able to grow it 
into more than 300, but the challenge was, was management. It, uh, the community has to be really involved, otherwise it will be difficult. Okay, so for the key findings, um, city converse populations in almost all areas that we surveyed are overfished except for unexploited sites. And uh, very openly, they harvest endangered species. Okay. Pertinent laws are not enforced. Some products, as mentioned, are low quality or undervalued. And rearing an ocean nurseries is very promising. Okay. So for recommendations, possibly number one, this is the, we think easiest, but very difficult to do, is enforce it. Enforce the ban of gathering of endangered species. By the way, in Palawan, we have the Palawan Council for Sustainable Development. We're very strict, you know, in implementing, um, <laughs> particularly in giving permits for research. Okay, so um, because most of our laws are national made, we prefer to have it uh, the local government to adopt it because the LGUs are the frontliners. The B4, they don't have, you know, much power to do the monitoring, but the local government has. And regulate the collection in the wild. Um, the LGU to declare a portion of their seagrass beds as NPA. So part of this result uh, was already presented to the LGU, and they are considering, uh, when they know that, you show to them that this seagrass area is the area of collection for city members. So as it be, you can declare a portion of this as no take zone so that the population can revive itself. And also establish size limit uh, per species. The B4, um, it has a one size limit for all species. And uh, it, of course, it's not applicable. And uh, studies on size at ma sexual maturity are underway. There is also a need to improve the drying process in the post-harvest because there is a big difference between the reject and uh, one with good quality. Lastly, there is a need to conduct an information campaign because when we ask, um, do you know that this species is endangered and should not be collected? Uh, they said, no, we are not aware of that. But they are not collecting mameng, they are not collecting turtles, even giant clams because they don't know, oh, we will be imprisoned if we do that. So I, I think by just doing the IEC, we can actually um, earn the, uh, we can have the people follow the rules. So, and <laughs> there's another one. Uh, since uh, our pilot testing was promising, we believe that uh, we have a small hatchery, but we were not yet able to do um, production of of uh, sea cucumbers, so that's one thing that we are looking into. We should produce the juveniles within Puerto Princesa City, otherwise it will be very costly to have the spawning at Coron or in Coron. Okay, and with that, thank you very much.